All right. Uh, the moment you have been waiting for is here. Glenn has he has gone. He has taken care of. He's gotten falafel. He went to FAO Schwartz. He picked up a pretzel. He got his iPhone unlocked. He's made his way to the studios here. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Raj is ready with his questions. Please enjoy the show. Very good. How are you? Oh. We adore you. How are you? Good to see you. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, let me, um, I'm actually not um, in charge of uh, tonight. We've tried to finish now. We, I think we finished uh, seven television shows. So this is seven in seventh show um, uh, in uh, four days. And I haven't had a chance to. Uh, even Tiffany came over in the, uh, w with me uh, from, the, uh, from Fox and she said, Tiffany is our executive producer. She is the one that is uh, one of the many that is responsible for um, the uh, record-breaking series, uh, the uh, Glenn Beck program, formerly known <coughs> as the Glenn Beck program on Fox television. Um, <coughs> and she said, do you want me to brief you on what this is, what's happening tonight? And I said, Nah, I'm going to wing it. And uh, I said, I'm not in charge, am I? And she said, no, Raj is going to be there. Let me bring, where's Raj? There. Where's Raj? Come on. Uh, Raj, is, um, Raj is a guy who uh, I hope that, um, I don't know why I got the broken <laughs> chair. Um, Raj is... <laughs> I mean, it is, we are a cheap organization. <laughs> um, Raj is a guy, I just hired him last week. Yeah. Last week, um, he flew in from San Diego, and uh, I had been hearing about him for a while, and he, I had seen some of his work. I mean, not actually because I stumbled on him, because I never <laughs> watch ESPN, um, but uh, he's been on ESPN, he did some other things, and people around my building have been talking to me about him for a while. So we flew him in last week. It was Thursday, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, last Thursday or something like that. And um, I said to him, uh, I sat with him, and it was the, my gosh, my father-in-law is here. <laughs> <laughs> my father-in-law <laughs> just had a stroke um, recently and is uh, doing uh, remarkable, and I love you, Dad. <laughs> They say the, uh, as I say, the um, uh, uh, shortest two interviews I've ever done with anybody is with uh, Betsy Morgan from uh, The Blaze and with Raj. And because I could see it in their eyes immediately when they walked in, they were good people. And, um, and uh, Raj really believes in a lot of the same things that I do um, and is not afraid to say them. And I think you're going to see great things from him. So he's in charge tonight. And I didn't want to give the uh, post-Fox interview to anybody else <laughs> because they, don't, they won't ask a single honest question. It'll all be, gotcha. <laughs> so, um, and it's the first time. I mean, we just worked with each other for half a week. So it may be gotcha with him, too. <laughs> but I, I hope not. OK, so where do we start? Uh, well, we asked your fans, ask Glenn any question. And we got thousands. So we narrowed it down. Uh, we got, I don't know, 50 here. Some of them are prying. Some of them are funny. Some of them are just what happened. So okay. um, let's just get right to it. Yeah. All, All right. right so 
Um, and Glenn has never seen any of these questions, so nope. let, let's say that to start off with. Okay, Ashley from Charlotte. When did you know it was time to leave the 5 p.m. show? How did you know? Um, I started getting a feeling that it was time to leave before uh, 8.28. I would say, uh, Pat, you would probably know, a uh, year, year and a half ago. Um, and I couldn't figure it out. I mean, nobody throws away this platform. And I knew it had to do with 828. I knew that, that they were com you know, um, combined, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to uh, Reverend Billy Graham, is because I had this strong feeling that, uh, that he had a piece of a puzzle for me that I needed to know. And I really thought, I'm, I'm gonna meet Billy Graham, and he's got something for me uh, that he's gonna tell me about. And that was about a year and a half ago, and we called, we reached out to Billy Graham's office, and um, they were like, yeah, he didn't really want to meet Glenn. And, um, <laughs> uh, and so I was really confused by that, and I just played the clip on the air um, tonight from, when was that clip, September? September? September, September 2010, where I said six months ago, I had met with a guy who I think is a spiritual advisor of mine, and um, uh, I said, uh, I'm supposed to leave Fox. I don't know why, but I'm supposed to leave Fox. And he said, great question. Where are you going? And I said, I don't, I don't know exactly. I said, but I, I think I do, but I'm not sure how it's all going to work out. And he gave me the best advice ever. He, said, he sat there for a minute. And he said, wait a season. When you see the leaves change, you'll know. Never run from something, run to something. And it wasn't until Wilmington that it all started to come together. I have had, had all these different things. Um, you know, I remember Betsy, I remember when I introduced the E4 project and you had just started with us. I don't even know if you had, yeah, you had just started. And I walked into Chris's office with the E4 project and I said, this is it, this is it. And she said, now how are you gonna do this one? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, do you remember this, Betsy? And she said, you've got a lot of projects. <laughs> what ties them all together? And I think I bluffed whatever I said to you. I was bluffing. Uh, inside, I was like, crap, she's right. Stop hiring smart people. <laughs> and um, uh, and it, was, it was really all of them started to come together right around Christmas where, where I knew uh, one of the things we're going to introduce tonight, um, we've named um, one of the things, and we've talked about mm -hmm. it, and uh, it all came together. So now all of these pieces that I've been, for some reason or another, doing, and I've been like, oh, yeah, i got to do that, now they all make sense to me. Now mm -hmm. they're all coming together under GBTV. Now, one thing that kind of drew me to you was the fact that you don't have some facade, you don't have um, some someone telling you what to say. So um, I guess the question that I think is cool about you is that, is that you're authentic, not the question, but the thing about you is that you're authentic. So I want you to answer this question. What is the biggest error that you made while on Fox? Thinking out loud. Um, biggest error I made, um, not because um, it's necessarily wholly inaccurate, um, because the words, if you read President Obama's book, he talks about a white culture um, a lot. What, what, um, which, which book? It's the, yeah, Dreams from My Father, and it's like, I don't know, page 178 or so, I don't remember, but I read that, and I had been reading, and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this. When I'm up in the morning, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, Fox and Friends was, is early, especially when you work you know, wall-to-wall -wall hours, and you're just thinking on the fly. Everything is just happening like that. And they asked me, and I made the now world-famous statement, and I think that was the biggest mistake because I didn't mean it as um, anything that was, I just meant it as this, this is who he is. He, mm -hmm. he doesn't look at things the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and that we should know and explore. And the way I have said things in the past, um, and that was one of them. Going off that, uh, 
Glenn is always talking about evil dude, George Soros. So where is the good dude? Who's the good dude? Where is he? Who is he? <laughs> um, I, I will tell you that I have met many people. I've met um, many frauds in um, faith, and I have met some amazing, um, uh, genuine people in faith. I think it's going to come back to people of faith. I'll tell you, one of the best dudes I know that I haven't hired, uh, although I wouldn't be opposed to it if he'd let me, is David Barton. He is... Here's a guy that... Here's a guy in, in the 1980s um, was challenged on something and he thought, well, let me pursue that. Let me look into that. And he did. Um, and he felt as he was looking into it, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm supposed to do this. And I'm supposed to hold this history up. And I've met a lot of people like that. Eric Metaxas is one of them that wrote the Bonhoeffer book. He did not want to write it. He didn't want to. He actually, and I do this all the time, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Really? No, I don't want to do that. Those people are remarkable to me. And there's a lot of those, a lot of those. Now, Glenn, can you explain to everyone what's going on here? <laughs> and what was going on in your mind when this I happened? I don't know. Uh, David Buckner, are you here? There he is, right there. That's David Buckner. David, was it, was it you and I, were you and I talking about this a couple of weeks ago, or who was it, Tiffany, that we were talking about what a surreal television moment this was? It was, was. at our, our lunch. Oh, we had a, I, I had a, a, a going away lunch um, that I, I took everybody on the floor crew to uh, at Fox, all the people that are involved with the show, and I took them, and we were talking about different things, and I said, that was one of the weirdest things because it showed me how un... Um, how you almost, when you're on television, and I think I am real and say everything that I, I feel like I'm really rooted in real, that I realize there's two brains going on. There is one that, if you're on television, is processing what do you do, what camera do you look at, what's happening, and then there's another one that's like <laughs> 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 And when he, I remember, you said, to, you said like, I'm going to pass out, right? Three times, yeah, I, mean, I don't rub it in. And <laughs> I'm standing at this plasma, and uh, we're talking about, I don't know. Toxic assets. Yeah, toss, toxic assets. <laughs> and uh, said, uh, and, he, and he just, I have under his breath, kind of looks at me, he's like, I'm going to pass out. And the brain, the part, the, <laughs> was kind of like, wait a minute, what did he say? <laughs> and then this brain's still going. And uh, the third time, I'm thinking, this brain is wait, I think there's trouble quickly coming <laughs> on the horizon. And you start, you went down. You caught me. You grabbed the hand. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. And then you stood over me and said, we're going to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> well, because everybody else, everybody else, the camera people, everybody had the same <laughs> reaction where you just didn't know. You were like, I don't know what, this hasn't happened on television before. I don't know what to do. It was really bizarre. I don't know if we should try that in real life when we're not on TV. Yeah. <laughs> How many people ended up viewing it, do you know? Uh, on well, YouTube? Close to two million something. Two I don't know. million. <laughs> Everywhere. If I'm ever with David, they're like, you're the guy who passed out on TV. <laughs> they don't even recognize me. They recognize him. I saw you on the floor of Fox. So did you really boil a frog? Where is... Uh, Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, Joel, you were there, right? You could probably um, verify. The, we were the luckiest people um, on, the, on the earth that we happened to save all of the tape of doing it. Do you remember? Did I ask to save it, for, or were we just lucky? You remember? I think we, I think we were lucky. I think we were lucky. Um, but I worked on this shot over and over again, remember? And we wanted to get it exactly right. And so part of it had to be taped, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, right. we pre-taped it. And we, and we had to, and because we're live, 
Um, and we don't rehearse anything. That one we rehearsed over and over again because it had to get right to the tape. So as we're going, getting ready to go on the air, I'm watching the monitor and I'm like, okay, I have to do it and now take it now. And then we threw it in and we had to switch the live frog, go to tape, grab the fake frog, come right back <laughs> and hand same position, boom. And because we happened to tape in advance, when the media said, oh, Glenn Beck, he's lying, he's making up, he really did boil a frog. We happen to have all of that tape, and we're like, you dopes. <laughs> and they still haven't learned. <laughs> yeah, got me again. One last, one last non-serious question. Have you ever been, have your, what was, okay, was there ever a prop you asked for that your, per, your producers refused to deliver? A horse. <laughs> right? It wouldn't fit in the elevator. Yeah, it wouldn't we fit in the elevator. We were on the 12th floor. <laughs> and it, it, God bless them, they actually looked and tried. Measured. They were like, and they came to me, Glenn, we couldn't get it in the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, are you sure? <laughs> That's, that's um, what we yeah, told of course. You, I, the, 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 the best, yeah, go ahead, That's Joel. what we told you. That's what you told me. You never actually tried, did you? I, I beat out the horse. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the best prop story for me is actually right here, the Lederhosen. This is the Lederhosen episode. Um, and by the way, this is, this is the only regret I have of working in cable news. This is the only... Uh, the only venture that I do that I don't own everything, um, I don't own any of the rights of that show except the research that we did. I, I hired many of the researchers, so I own the research that we did. But I can't, those episodes will never be seen again unless Fox decides to use them for some reason. So all of these things I can never show again, um, which is really, um, it bums me out. But the episode where I was wearing Lederhosen, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. And I, I was walking over and I said, I need Lederhosen. <laughs> and without blinking an eye, my staff went, okay. They didn't even ask what for. <laughs> it was 15 minutes only in New York. It was 15 minutes before we went on the air. And I said, do we have the Lederhosen? We're running out of time, I gotta change. And they said, wait, Lederhosen's here. And they ran it in, I changed, put it all underneath. Jack, our sound guy, helped me get all done again. So when I stood up, I don't know if anybody saw that episode, but I was wearing my tie and I had my jacket and you couldn't see anything, no Lederhosen. And I just at some point just stood up and took my jacket off and I'm in Lederhosen. <laughs> Edelweiss, Edelweiss. It was great. <laughs> All right, one last serious question about Fox. Uh, Denny from Melbourne, Florida wants to know, was there any subject or area of concern that you were not allowed to investigate as in depth as you wanted? Uh, no, they never um, censored. If the question is, did they censor? Never. Was there anything they were concerned about? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> Um, I, I made them, um, as, as if, if I were working for me, um, I would have made me nervous because I intentionally, like 828, if you go back and you look in your, at least in your memory bank, the only network that didn't carry that live start to finish was Fox. And the reason why, I, I've never talked to him about this, um, but I would imagine the reason why was that I never told them one thing about it. And um, I didn't because I didn't want them to, I didn't want ever anyone to be able to say, well, they coordinate, they did. And I think they never said anything about it. Um, but I gotta believe that made them wildly nervous. And I think they, because they didn't know what was gonna happen and they were like, he's not our guy. You know, if something would have, if something, because that was, we talked about it the night before. The Panthers were coming after us. Um, nobody in the crowd knew. Um, I intentionally put, do you remember Tiffany? I, the only time I think I raised my voice on that weekend was just to make sure somebody heard me say it. I was standing backstage and I started hearing the ch crowd chant, USA, USA. And I said, 
loudly across the tent, get that music back on, get it on now. And we were running just a couple of minutes late and I had specifically picked um, uh, spiritual music and music that was very peaceful because I knew left unattended, especially if there was anybody coming around trying to jack people up, it could spiral out of control. And we were talking that weekend before, if something would have happened, God forbid something happened to Sarah Palin or, you know, God mm. forbid, the atmosphere in the country would have spiraled into civil war. I, I really believe it. Um, and now here we are this week, uh, the, uh, this summer, going to Israel, which could spiral things horribly if everybody isn't really cool. I know our people will be, and I know what we have planned. And again, I haven't told anyone, even my own staff, somebody on my own staff said, I, 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 I have to know some of the details. Nope. Nope. You'll know it when you see it. Now, this is actually one of my favorite questions. I mean, this is something that I would have asked you. So this is probably my least favorite. <laughs> um, but this is something that I, we talked about when I, when I first met you. How do you keep your ego in check while being the face of Mercury, GBTV, publishing, etc., and needing constantly to promote the brand of yourself? Um, if you saw the first episode of the making of GBTV, I said, should we explore this name again? Can we go back to not make it GBTV? What did I say? You didn't even know what it meant. Nobody on my staff meant when I hired you. Do you remember what I told them? I think they told you hmm. what I, why I hired you and what I said about you. Do you remember? Did you, you ever hear it? Uh, you said because you thought I was No, no, no. Authentic. I said, when I said what your job was, <laughs> yeah. I said, he's the face of GBTV. And e everyone said, I think you're the face of GBTV. <laughs> um, and I don't want it to be um, uh, about me. Um, that was the vehicle that got us to where we are to be able to do the things that we have to do. I don't want it to be um, me. The only way I could, I, I really truly believe, and this is why I believe the country is going to be fine if we let her bottom out. Let her bottom out. Because that's the way you renew yourself. Whether you want to look at, at, at the atonement or the Kondrakiev wave, when it bottoms out, green shoots can come again. I was, I think, prepared for this um, because of bottoming out in the 90s. I mean, my whole life was a mess until 1995 and really until 2000, 1999, when I um, uh, accepted the atonement and um, changed my life. And when I, I told this story on the air tonight, Tanya and I were, we had just attended Spider-Man like the 40th time. <laughs> and um, we were sitting uh, with my best friend growing up in high school. We were losers. I mean, not that we've changed, but <laughs> we were losers. And we were sitting there and uh, a text comes over my phone. And uh, I know I was supposed to turn it off, but I didn't. And we're in the middle of the show and I pointed it to Tanya and she just laughed. And then I pointed it to my friend Robert, and he just started to laugh. And I said, I can't believe our lives. And what the text said was, Bono's backstage, like to meet you, would you like to meet him? I'm not even a fan of Bono, but it's Bono. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And so we went back, uh, we went backstage and, uh, you know, we hung for 30 minutes, just talked about stuff. <laughs> and uh, when we went back home, I had already made the decision, we have to leave. I don't think we had announced it yet. Um, had to leave. Tanya and I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with it. And the, one of the reasons why I wrestled is because I thought, how can it be divine inspiration to have this huge platform that doesn't get any bigger than Fox in an economy that is about to fall apart and throw it all away. And I'm standing there in my apartment, and I said on the air today, in my high school yearbook, I believe I haven't seen it since high school, but I believe I wrote New York City, NBC, Rockefeller Center. 
and it was me a goal to work for NBC Radio um, at Rockefeller Center uh, in New York City. I've always wanted to live here. I love this city. Uh, they don't like me so much, but I <laughs> love this city. And, uh, and I sat there, and I had this beautiful view of the city, and I thought, I said to Tanya, how can this be? How can we throw this all away? And she went, good night. <laughs> she went to bed, and I stood there alone in the dark, just looking at the city. And I was overwhelmed with the feeling, if you do not get out now, you will not get out with your soul. And never want something too much. And that night with uh, Bono and being treated like a king and then coming back at the, um, and you know, feeling like Caesar, um, it's very seductive. Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't have lost my soul once, I would have lost it again. Mm. I think that's really poignant. I mean, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> Shit. We need new chairs. This chair sucks. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Please continue to subscribe every month because we need chairs. <laughs> Um, we're going to get more into, into what GBTV is all about, yeah. but I know your, your passion is, is giving people a voice, giving people that don't really have a voice a voice. So here's, a, here's the next question. If you could, who would you make a household name in order to really influence the American people in a positive way? Um, David Barton is one. Um, I think you are. Um, I'm not prepared to... <laughs> Um, re reveal what it was specifically that Raj, uh, Raj laid out for me in my office. Um, I said, so, you have a blank canvas. What's your passion? What is, what is the thing that you believe is the most important thing to solve? And he told me something, and I said, well, they'll kill you for that. And he knew that I didn't mean, you know, uh, oh, they'll kill you in the press. I mean they'll kill him for it. And um, he looked at me and he said, yep, maybe. And I said, uh, why would you do it? Without hesitation, he looked at me and he said, if we're not there yet, we soon will be. If, you, uh, if you're not risking your life for what you believe in, you're probably on the wrong side. I thought, wow. And I'm, so, and I'm thinking to myself, and I'm thinking to myself, when I was 25, I was like, come on, let's have another. <laughs> so what, when, when do I get to talk about it? Uh, when we know that we can keep you safe and <laughs> most likely when most of it is finished. Yeah. So we don't risk. <laughs> the one thing I have learned is when I was 25, I was uh, invincible and impatient. The thing that I have learned going back to your what's your mistake question is, shh, take your time. Um, there were things that we learned right off the bat with uh, when we were going into Van Jones. Do not tip your hand um, until you have everything done. Because as soon as you tell anybody, the other side comes in and whacks you. And mm. you, you, you can't tip your hand. Mm. Not in today's world. You, you can't tip your hand. Mm. Not in today's world. All right, now a very serious question. Chris from Coral Springs, Florida. Now that you have given up your twigs and berry diet, will we see the return of a more portly Glenn? <laughs> I haven't actually given up my twigs and berry diet. I have, um, I have actually um, asked that I change my diet a little bit to, um, well, quite a bit, actually, dramatically. <laughs> um, <laughs> to lose um, uh, some additional weight because I just, I'm, I'm just, I just feel, I feel bloated sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, my system rejects, and I am happy to say, my system rejects vegetables and fruits. <laughs> it hates them. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm this summer a meat eater. <laughs>
and uh, uh, my, my neuropathy has um, uh, reversed itself in a dramatic <laughs> way. Now, Glenn, all over your office in the Mercury Radio Arts Building is just pictures of the founding fathers. So I thought this was actually a really interesting question. Which one of the fathers George do you Washington. not respect? Do I not respect? Why? Oh, there, I, I, don't, I respect all of them. I'm not really fond of uh, Hamilton because um, he wanted a big central bank. And, um, uh, you know, he was, um, you know, in 1791 or 1789, he was like, you know, this isn't working out. Maybe we should just go back to a king kind of thing. And you're like, <laughs> okay, Hamilton. Mm. Um, but um, <laughs> I, I have respect for him because in the end, he wrote most of the Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's really none of them. Uh, you know, you could say um, Thomas Paine, um, because I think he really, really lost his way. Um, Washington, I don't think Washington ended up, you know, Pat, I don't think Washington ended up speaking to Thomas Paine in the end. Yeah, yeah. they were, they, he was like really, uh, yeah, they were enemies at the end. If you're an enemy of George Washington, you might be on the wrong side. Um, and, uh, but I still respect him for what he did. Yeah. All right, we're going to go into the GBTV questions, but first, I can't tell you how many questions were about technical things. So I have to ask these because we had probably 25% of the questions were technical stuff. So. May I just say this on the technical side? Yeah. Did we put, post that sign this morning? Yes. Yes, okay. If, if you're watching now or you've signed up now, it said something, I asked for something to be put up on the website that says, you know, um, if you experience difficulty, which I think we did because of the volume that is remarkable volume uh, this evening. I want you to know that what you're seeing right now, this is not the platform of GBTV. We entered into an agreement with um, the people at Major League Baseball and um, they are building it for us. And what they're building for us um, will be launched hopefully by 824, but I, I don't even know if that'll make it, mm -hmm. but it will be for uh, 912 you won't have any of these problems that, you know, or if it's catching, et cetera, et cetera, because that was one of my main concerns. I don't want to watch this hit loading, loading. I want to watch it like television. <laughs> right, and that's a lot of the questions that people have, something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, so what you're seeing now is not what, go to Major League Baseball, go to MLB.com, that's the technology that we're using, and what they're designing for us is beyond even what they have done. Wow. Um, what they're designing uh, for us that will probably not be ready for a year is truly going to revolutionize everything you know about um, the way you watch television or mm -hmm. the way you get your information. Now, a lot of people ask, that's a technical question, but it's, it's, more, it's more than that. Uh, Leslie from Idaho, what if, what if you're ahead of, ahead of the time here at GBTV? Will people get out of their comfort zones, of the living rooms and their DVRs, and go sit and watch the computer? Well, I hope that you're not going to be sitting and watching a computer. I mean, it won't be long. I mean, first of all, um, uh, and I can't announce anything um, yet, but soon um, there are already devices like Roku that you can throw it up on your, your TV. Uh, many people understand Xbox, PlayStation, um, all of that. This is designed to, just like Major League Baseball, and this is why we went to them, um, it's designed to watch it in an airport, in your car, um, you know, mm -hmm. wherever you are, including your living room on your television. Nobody wants to watch it on a laptop. However, if you're watching it on that lap, you know, laptop or you know, your computer, um, a year from now, there will be additional benefits to keep you on your laptop because it is going to be, I'm tired of having to reset. Okay, now you remember Crime Inc. Crime Inc. was, and we waste four minutes resetting. And they're very complex. What we're designing is a whole system that will take you into our brain and our entire research system that you will be able to pause and say, wait, I don't know Crime Inc. Pause. It will say, don't know what Crime Inc. is? Click. It will replay in segments all the things that you might have missed. You can go down or you can go up. That I still don't understand it. I, I need to go down further. I need to go down further. And it will dig you all the way down to the very beginning if you need it. And then it will also, after the segment, it will also take you further. It will take you on the things we didn't address that are really important but very esoteric. So you'll be able to go both directions and then go, okay, I got it. 
click and start it again and, and watch it. You'll That's also awesome. be able to pull things off um, and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What Glenn missed was this and this connection. And you'll see something that really bothers you for some reason. And you'll be able to say, I want from this word to this word, pull that video off and put it into a file for you. And then you start building up your own file so you are keeping track of what you are tracking. But then um, you'll also be able to tie it together and then ship it to us electronically so we can look at it, see what you're working on and go, wow, I didn't see it that way. That's a great point. And then it's very interactive what's coming. And that kind of goes into the questions about, about, about GBTV. <laughs> um, I mean, this, this, is, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm amped about. Uh, Chris from Champaign asked a question that, that you and I have talked a lot about. As a 14-year-old, I feel powerless in today's world. What can someone my age really do to change this country and make a difference? Um, a ton. Um, and this is one thing that we had a meeting today. We just hired. I cannot believe I'm saying these words, but I hired a community organizer today. <laughs> and I hired somebody who is um, wildly conservative and was going to one of the Ivy League schools here in New York and was very, very frustrated because um, nobody had a clue as to how the system was. And all the conservatives were like, well, no, we'll just march or something. And you know, um, we didn't have any idea. The left has been community organizing. It's just part of the culture of the left. Um, and so she, when she was in college, um, she started organizing. And she started organizing colleges all over the country. And she started teaching people how to work together and how to turn the system on itself that they have built on community organizing. Mm -hmm. um, that is critical to know. So the, the, I hired her because the first step, as we talked about in this meeting today, is to first put a, put a big net out and say, what fish can I catch? Who wants in the boat? I talked about it when I was over at Fox. I said, um, there's going to come a time. The boat is sinking. There's going to come a time. I'm going to say, get in the lifeboats. Go. Well, that time is now. And here's the lifeboat. But it doesn't mean we go out and then whack people on the head with paddles and oars. Well, you should have listened to me. Boom. <laughs> what it means is now we have to go take our lifeboats out, have a safe place, set things up so we now can go back out and say, Who's there? Who, who, who needs help? Mm -hmm. And we'll do that. But we first now, we put the first net out. Now we have to put another net out for the youth and see which youth instinctively get it. The many things that we've talked about, mm -hmm. you and I personally, I mean, we took that walk on the street. There were so many things that I had said that I've said forever. But nobody his age watches Fox or CNN or anything. They don't do it. Mm -hmm. And we need to cast that net out in a completely different way because people will instinctively get it. I believe that freedom is more instinctive to your generation than mine because you already have YouTube and everything else where you are directly right, shoot right to entrepreneur. Right. Where I didn't grow up that way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So there's a lot, but the first thing is we have to cast that net, bring people together, and then um, teach them that they are not powerless, mm -hmm. we surround them. Now, I think a lot of people do feel powerless that are in my generation because it's either, okay, fight big government or fight big corporations. So a lot of kids my age, they just want to fight the man, but they're not really sure who it is. So who is the man, Mr. Beck? Anybody who is trying to take control of your life, anybody who is trying to tell you how to eat, um, that's your parents' job. And not enough parents have done it, so now you need a babysitter. Um, and whether they're trying just to take care of you, the way to take care of you is to teach you the difference between right and wrong. You eat that, you're gonna die early. Well, I don't care. Well, great, I'm not paying for you when you're big fat and you have to have the fire department come in to cut a hole in your house to take you out. I ain't paying <laughs> for that. You will. Um, and anybody who is trying to take care of you 
um, and not teach you the fundamentals of standing on your, two, your own two feet is the man. Mm -hmm. um, what, there's a fake option that is being set up, and that is it's either Republicans or Democrats. No, there's a third way. By saying I want to take down the evil giant corporation, and some of them are evil, but they'll destroy themselves once you connect with reality. What you're doing is saying, I want to get rid of this big evil corporation, so I'm going to give all of this power to a giant government. They both want power and money. One just takes it from you in the end. The other still at least has to put commercials on the air to convince you. The last thing you want to do is give that power to somebody else. Take that power and those rights back. So Bill asks, are you going to be more of an activist or an informer? I'm going to be a citizen. Um, and that is uh, someone who is informed themselves, will inform anyone that will listen, uh, and, uh, and then put it in action. Mm -hmm. Citizen. Now, a, a lot of questions are about questions from the youth. And, and, they're, and they're watching this right now. And they're saying, Glenn, I, I hear you. It makes sense. But how do, I, how do I do anything? How do I get involved? How do I make a difference? How do I Identif actually practically do something? Identify yourself first. I don't know where. I mean, Raj, I, I remember when we were in the office and I think you flew. I said, go get your stuff. You're, he lives in San Diego. And he's in my office. And I said, go get your stuff and come back tomorrow. And he did. And my clock's all messed up. I know, your clock's <laughs> all messed up. And um, he, uh, he, um, when he got back, I said, you're an answer to a prayer. I have been praying for people. Please, Lord, please. I, I, I have my puzzle piece. I, I have the platform. I know what we can do. But I can't do it. I need people to come now and add their piece to mm -hmm. it. When I said you're an answer to a prayer, that's what I meant. They have to identify themselves and now start coming. Mm -hmm. And we will put it together. The first thing that you should do is find those like-minded people and stand with them. And then connect with each other and then identify yourself. Over here, over here, we want help or we want to be of help. There are more people in this country that want to help than need help. So let's, let's separate ourselves first. Who needs help and who wants to help? That's what I'm doing first. Who wants to help and needs help to help? Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the thing you do this summer. I also think that, again, everything has to be built. I have learned. Um, when we tried to build certain things, I don't remember what the best example is. I think it was probably 828. I think it was 828. Um, and it's happening again with Israel. I know what, I know what has to happen, but I don't necessarily uh, know how to build it. And so I'll get stuck on something. I'll be like, okay, I'm just going to build this first. I'm just going to start over here. And that, will be, that, will go, that won't go anywhere. And so I'm sitting here spinning my wheels, I feel like, okay, 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 okay. And I'm praying, can you help? Send me a flare. I, I don't know what I'm waiting for. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And we keep going back until that one piece is built. It all has to be built, the foundation from the, do the first thing first, then the next, then the next. If you get stuck here, you can't build the roof. Mm -hmm. You need to put the windows in first. You know what I mean? You need to frame the house first. When you get to the top, then you can put the roof on. Mm -hmm. um, so first things first. Educate, you know what I mean? You need to frame the house first. When you get to the top, then you can put the roof on. Mm -hmm. um, so first things first. Educate yourself. I want every American, and we're going to put a list of books out, um, none of which are mine, um, but um, we're going to put a list of books out here. And the first one that I challenge you to read is called The Hiding Place. came out in 1971. I don't know if anybody's, has anybody ever read it? It's great, isn't it? It's a story about, uh, story about um, uh, some people in Holland uh, that are, um, um, it's 1930, starts I think in 1933. They start to see the things in Germany, but they deny it. And they're saying, no, that's crazy. And they're really a great family. Um, then um, 
the Dutch are overrun by uh, the Germans and they see what's going on, but they are rock solid people. And they decide this is wrong. They're Christians and this is wrong. And so they start the hiding place and they start hiding people in their home. And it, it really, this is such an amazing story, the first half, but then they're caught and they're sent to the camps. And um, the miracles that they see, the, the protection of divine providence, and how if they do the right thing every step of the way, it will work out. Um, find somebody, mine is George Washington, find somebody that you can look to that is not wearing a cape and a superhero outfit <laughs> that you can say, I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. I, I was at Fox today, and as I was getting ready to leave, somebody on the set said, these cameras are yours, right? Are they, all these old, great cameras that are going to sit in a closet someplace. Nobody will ever use them again. Um, you know, if, if they remain, so otherwise they'll just give them out to people on the staff or whatever. And I actually sat there and I thought, oh my, I'd love these cameras. These are so great. And I, boy, they wouldn't, nobody would ever question me. And I went, no, they're not mine. And I put it back down on the shelf. And I think I said on the air tonight, it sucks to be a, a person of character sometime. But you have to do it. Because if you compromise one inch, it all comes undone. Hmm. And, and you know, a lot of people in my generation, and we've talked about this, and I know it annoys you, have basically pigeonholed you as, as this Republican spokesman, you know? And I know that, I know that frustrates you. Um, so the Republicans love me as much as I love them. <laughs> so I mean, that, that's, that's the whole point, is reaching people that, that my generation that don't watch cable news. So the question here from Evan in Dallas, GBTV's distribution model runs the risk of preaching to the choir. What are you guys planning on doing in order to bring others into the fold? Um, not prepared to say at, at this time. Um, I do need to get the choir in the seats. Um, but I know I have gone to churches before um, that have just rockin' choirs um, that I didn't necessarily want to hear the message of the preacher, but I sat my butt down in that pew because I wanted to hear that choir. First, let's put the choir together mm -hmm. and uh, let's start. Let's be people who will fill the air with music and others will um, come. I really truly believe that this audience is going to be the one that will be remembered. Whether we remembered as the ones who save the nation or are or, or righteous among the nations or um, just really good people, I don't know. I think, they're going, I think they're going to be remembered as those who saved um, man's freedom. But it's going to happen when the rest of the world is freaking out and the rest of the world looks like Greece. If the world looks like Greece or Egypt, I can guarantee you there were more people in their houses afraid than there were out in the streets. And that's where you will come in. Because the left, those who want to seize your, to seize your freedoms, they'll, have, they'll top down, bottom up, inside out. The time that you will save the nation is when you're prepared and you say, knew this was coming. Don't worry. If you read the gospel, um, Jesus talks about it. They say, what, what's going to happen? You said the temple's going to be torn down. You said all this stuff's going to happen. That sounds really bad. And Jesus said, look, these things are going to happen. And when they do, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Don't have fear. Know that they must happen. Hmm. That's, that's our role, to say to people in advance, this is what is coming. So when it does, you'll recognize how close you are to being the person to say, it's okay. It's okay. Just remain who you are. Now, 
save the nation. I mean, when you, when you talk to people that work at Mercury, they get it. But for people like Carrie, that seems like a pretty daunting thing. So what's the most daunting aspect of this new endeavor at GBTV? Um, it's not about saving the nation. It's about saving the world. Um, it is not um, going to be... Um, I challenge every single person within the sound of my voice, I challenge every single person to today make a commitment that you will be an ambassador of freedom. When the answer that Billy, Billy Graham gave me when I finally met with him, and I said to Joel Cheatwood, remember you were, we were standing out in a, at the elevator banks, and I said, Joel, we have to design the studios this way. We hadn't announced it or anything. And I said, we have, to, uh, we have to design the studios this way and this way. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know, but I'm just telling you that we do. And Billy Graham has the answer. And he said to me, um, why don't you call Billy Graham? And I said, I, I did. And he said, it's not time to meet yet. And that was about a year ago. That day, Billy Graham's office called me and said, it's time to meet. When I did, I thought he was going to have an answer. He didn't. He gave me a book. And in the book, and I knew it when I opened it, I sat there in my office, and I opened the book. And there were his crusades. And I thought, it's 828. It's Israel. It's it's all of these things. And I, I'm not going to be surprised, but I wept. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, because I just knew that's what it was. It's a movement. And I closed the book, and the name of the book is Billy Graham, God's Ambassador. And I thought, who but Billy Graham could put that on a book? And everybody would be like, yep, that's who he is. <laughs> and... Um, what I had been arguing, because I had started to read Whitfield a year and a half before, and I had seen that in my head. Um, I had read the part where Whitfield was in a crowd, and he was speaking, and there were thousands of people there, and he was despised by many who were in power, and somebody was in a tree up above him, and mocking him the whole time, but he never stopped. And at one point, the guy dropped his pants and peed on Whitfield. And Whitfield didn't stop. And I remember being overwhelmed. Uh, this is right before, uh, this is when I first met David Barton. And he said, you need to read Whitfield. So this has been a long time. And I read that and I was overwhelmed with the feeling, this is how it ends for you. This is how, this is, this is what's coming. And I, it bothered me so much. I closed the book, and I put the book down for almost a month. And uh, I was freaked out. And the first thing I thought of is, well, I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a spiritual leader. I'm not. And um, how could that possibly be? And, um, and I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> I told my wife after this, Bryant Park thing that happened this week. I've been um, the geek ever since I was a kid. It would be really cool. That's why that Bono thing was so tempting, because it's nice to hang out with the cool people. It's nice to be with celebrities. It's nice to be, you know, loved, and you know, you get all the accolades from all the smart people in the world. I, I don't get that. I never have. Um, but everybody, everybody wants it. Um, and that's why so many people lose their souls, I think, on the left, because it's, it's easy. Um, and here, um, here I was reading this from Whitfield, and I'm like, no, I don't want any more of this. And um, when I closed the book of Billy Graham and I saw Ambassador to God, I again thought, but I'm not. And then it immediately came to me. I know I'm not. But I can be an ambassador to man's freedom. I can, be, I can be a spokesperson for that. Globally, a spokesperson for do the right thing and, and stand for man's 
right to exist and to be free and to pursue mm. his happiness. And it's not going to be just me. I challenge you, be an ambassador and it will happen over the entire globe. It will happen. Now, there are a lot of people and forces that are against you. So do you ever get... <laughs> Is somebody peeing on my head? <laughs> I mean, but do you ever get overwhelmed? Do you ever get scared? Be honest. Yeah. I was um, frightened for my family. Not for me, but for my family at Bryant Park. I, I'm used to people calling me names. It's sad that I'm used to it. Um, but I am. Um, you know, Ann Coulter gets the same, everybody, you probably get the same thing too. Um, and um, I'm used to it. But I was afraid for my family and my children. They're, they're uninvolved. And when we left, and I, the movie was over, and it was just ending, and the movie was over, and I was walking away, and we were trying to duck out and get there before my older children, um, so my older children could just stay and leave in peace and stuff. We tried to duck out, and th um, the crowd started to cheer that I was leaving, and they were like, get out! And um, Why do you think that is? Uh, because they're misinformed. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, they, when my, um, uh, when that happened, my wife looked at me and said, what has happened to people? And we got past the crowd and I felt really bad because somebody came up and he was a young college student. He said, I'm part of the such and such Republicans club. And people were shouting stuff at us. And I was so nervous about anybody. I didn't trust anybody. And I said, I'm sorry. And I think he really wanted to say something nice or whatever, but we pushed him away right away and we got out of there. And as soon as I got past that crowd, I looked at my security detail and I said, go back for my children. Don't leave them. Don't leave them there. Um, that's wrong. That is just wrong. Wrong. I don't know when we turned into that. Now, you say that these people are, are misinformed. What, what should they know? What would change that? That I am not wanting to take anyone's right away for anything. I've never shouted anyone down. I've never um, asked for anyone to be fired or silenced, nor would I ever. That is the, um, that is the wrong side. Um, they don't know history. They don't really know our founders. They don't know what they stood for. The, the, every 20 something in America, if they don't do it now, they will when the country is brought and the whole world is brought to its knees and in darkness, they will learn about Jefferson mm -hmm. and John Adams and Sam Adams. And these guys will become heroes to them because while it's all in you know, tough language to read now. That's why we did the original argument and translated the Federalist Papers. When you see, they were the biggest revolutionaries of them all. They make Van Jones look like a rookie. Um, and the reason why they make him look like a rookie is because they have to use hate, force, violence, and lies. Mm. These guys set it straight up and their thinking is so revolutionary. Mm. Now, now, um, I'm being told that we gotta have to wrap it up, and, but, but the one thing that I wanted to end it on um, that I know is where your heart is, Kyle asks, how can I get involved in the charity wing of GBTV? Um, again, the first thing you can do is um, this summer, prepare yourself. Um, be the very best that you can be, know what is true, um, and identify those people around you that want to join you in that. Um, the first thing you can do this summer is to join us um, either in Israel or in Israel virtually with um, 824. 821, have we announced any of this yet? Well, I'm gonna announce some of it. <laughs> 
821 is the first event, and it's on a Sunday um, night in Jerusalem, um, and we timed it so it could be at about noon um, uh, here in America. I never work on the Sabbath unless your ox is in the mire or it is the, the Lord's um, work. And um, telling the truth about um, Israel and about love and about him is his work. And so we are um, going to uh, first, I have the biggest spiritual leaders from all over the world. Um, and it's quite amazing who's coming. Um, and we are going to do a program that will be in Jerusalem in the place where Pontius Pilate was. Um, and it is going to be a music of inspiration of what it means to be a person of faith and courage. And I ask you to organize your church or, or whatever and gather with people unlike you. Gather with, if you're a Christian, gather with Jewish people or Muslim or whoever that understands faith and freedom and join us. This is a real Christian event, um, so it might make some people uncomfortable um, because it is the only event that is uber Christian. But get your churches involved. That's the first night. The second night is um, uh, going to be about um, people who seek solutions this one's a much more tangible um, think tank kind of leaders from all around the world and what they see as solutions on how to um, be people of peace and yet stand firm in what you believe. And then 824, and that is a universal event that I promise you will blow your mind when you see what we're doing. It is, I'm not kidding you, I'm standing at the uh, southern wall of the Temple Mount. Behind me is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The windows were open the day I went, and you can see into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, as I'm standing here, a little farther than this wall is that wall of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. About where that exit sign is, is where Jesus turned the temples over in the table. Over here on these stairs is where Jesus was found teaching. It is an amazing, amazing sight. And what we have doing, what we're going to do there is um, all over the world, people have gone to the seat of power in Spain, in Greece, in Australia. The tea parties went to Washington, D.C., and no one was listening to them because we're going to the wrong seat of power. We have to return to the original seat of power. It is the original seat. And return, and return there and say, we get it. We get it. We know who's in charge. We know your will will be done, and we, people of faith, of all faiths, will stand together and serve you and protect against injustice. I don't care if it's on the Israeli side, the American side, the Palestinian side, it doesn't matter. Who will stand up and say, I'm sorry, I have no horse in this race except him, and I will stand as a shield for anyone against injustice. It will be a life-changing event. That's the first thing. Then on 9-12, we're going to um, introduce you to this. We touched on it on the opening show of GBTV, and I wanted to show you about three minutes of this. Um, this is something we have, when we cut this package, it says, still unnamed. I named it last night. The name of this charity venture is Mercury One, and it means several things. One mind, one heart, one body, saving the country, one person, one family, one entrepreneur, one town at a time. Mercury 
one. But it also is not just the name of my company, Mercury. It also should sound familiar. Mercury, it was the space project. It was the first space project. When you didn't know anything except the Russians have put monkeys in space? Think how odd that seemed. That's kind of like, wait a minute, communist in the White House? <laughs> we have monkeys in space? We have, we have things that I thought would never, ever happen. They're happening. And it's not our side that's doing it. It's not our side that's doing it. They launched Friendship 7. That was one of them. And it was the Mercury Space Project. And it took us to new heights. And we come out of this darkness of the 50s of tearing each other apart and having you know, these commie uh, trials and everything else, even though they existed. Now, people looked at it and said, wait, there's something great happening. Look what we can do. In the 60s, you were mired in the mud at Woodstock and you were saying, tear down the system, or you were looking to the moon and the heavens and you were saying, look what man can achieve. That's what we're going to do, and here is a taste of it. But first. Oh, but first. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Come back. Good night, everybody. For America to survive, all that we have to do, you and me, is to remember. Remember who we are, where we came from, what we're capable of doing. Remember who gave us the freedom that defines the very essence of this great country. Remember the responsibility that accompanies that freedom. Throughout history, wherever need around the world has arisen, Americans have been the first on the scene. First to give, to pray, to feel the pain of their fellow man, and look for a way to ease that suffering. Americans are that way, not through happenstance, but by design. It was part of the original blueprint, what Ben Franklin called the American religion, serving God by serving each other. Now, it's America that finds itself in need. And there are no rescue ships crossing the seas, no countries offering to erase our debt or feed the hungry, give shelter to our homeless, or rebuild our towns and cities destroyed by catastrophe. We, you and me, must save America by saving ourselves. And we will. Mercury Radio Arts is building a humanitarian project without a name at this point. It will be self-funded and uniquely American. It will be a hand up, not a hand out. You will be challenged to become part of a rapid response team in your own region. When a neighbor is in need, you will be there to respond, to feed, to clothe, to comfort. This nonprofit organization will be a constant reminder that our solutions do not reside in Washington, but they reside within you and me. It is the American spirit. This will be a grassroots effort that, in reality, will only be as big as our American imagination and ingenuity will still allow it to become. It will not be funded by taxpayer dollars and will look for other ways besides charitable donations to survive. This venture will look to restore an idea that has also been forgotten, that capitalism is only a reflection of the values of those who use it. It's neither good nor bad. It just is simply what you make of it. That's where 1791 comes in. For some, 1791 will simply be a new line of clothing. But to others, it will become a way of life. Just as Paul Newman established the line of Newman's own products to help at-risk children, 1791 will be a tool used to help rebuild America. 1791 clothing will be a constant reminder to those that wear it that we are a people of merit and that we haven't forgotten that with those rights enshrined in that historic year came great responsibility. Oh, and there's one more thing. A plethora of shuttered mills and factories across America bear witness to the fact that so much of what is needed to make American quality apparel 
has been lost. This, too, will need to be remembered. This, too, will need to be rediscovered. I believe that somewhere out there, there is a town searching for a second chance, a mill waiting to be reopened, re-energized with dedication and the skill of American craftsmen and women who will embrace the opportunity to create something with lasting value and real meaning. This is where our journey will begin. With all the profits going to Mercury's American Relief Programs, 1791 will help neighbors help neighbors in an unprecedented way. In the end, it does all come back to just you and me. Will we be part of the solution or content to be victimized by our problems? GBTV will be asking you to help us explore new and innovative ways to rebuild our country using the original blueprints left behind by our founding fathers. America needs you. You're here for a reason. Get involved and help spread the word. In what may become the biggest challenge in our nation's history, with your help, we will see our greatest hour. Our steepest climb will be to simply remember the Americans are already here. Voices cry out for. We're the Americans the world has waited for. We are the truth. We are the future. We are GBTV.